Welcome to the Relatable Leader Podcast. This is your behind the scenes access to coaching that supports your leadership. And now, here's your host, certified trainer and professional coach, Catherine Goja. Hello, leaders. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of the Relatable Leader Podcast. I appreciate you being here and also subscribing to the podcast. And if you've been listening for a while and if you find that this podcast creates value for you, it's my job to also encourage you to post reviews because that might inspire other supervisors, managers, and even C-suite leaders to listen to the podcast. Thanks again, and I really appreciate your effort in those ways. This week, Rebecca Zucker from Next Step Partners joins us. She's going to talk about different mindsets and also strategic thinking, in addition to some other value points to share with you. We'll get to that interview in just a couple minutes. First, real quick, I'm going to cover the topics that are coming up in the next few weeks with me, both in webinars and in live workshops. This episode will originally air in March 2019, and if you are listening live time on the 13th, I am facilitating communicating with influence from 9 to 11 that webinar Pacific Standard Time and then also on the 27th motivating others if you'd like to join me for webinar Wednesdays just go to my website relatableleader.com and you'll see at the top the different pages and webinar Wednesdays is up there I have already kicked off the conflict and the coaching series so if you join me for session one of those in the live workshops you'll continue through that series if you haven't jumped on board for that yet and you work here in northern california in butte county or the surrounding area you'll be able to register for that series again in the fall because i repeat every series in the spring and fall so you can catch up with me then a standalone training that I'm facilitating on March 14th is Multitasking for Excellence. And that's going to run from 8.30 to 11.30 there at the Skyway Center in the Butte College training place where I provide most of my live workshops. want to encourage you for that, especially those of you who have been surviving everything the last several weeks of after the campfire. Uh, multitasking is a great training for you to join me I'll give you some tips and tools I think right now for those people who were directly impacted by the fire it's all we can do to just show up every day for work on time but of course we also want to get back to productivity levels so again I just invite you warmly to that it's a fun space it's a safe training space and I'd love to have you join me All right, let's get into our interview with Rebecca Zucker. She is the co-founder of Next Steps Partners and also a contributor to both the Harvard Business Review and Forbes. She joins me today on Skype. Rebecca Zucker, I want to welcome you to the Relatable Leader Podcast. Tell us about how your organization, Next Step Partners, was born 17 years ago. Sure. My co-founder and I started Next Step Partners it was shortly after 9-11, and the economy was in the tank. So there were no leadership budgets, and we found that most of our clients were in career transition, and these were highly accomplished people who had typically gone to business school at a top program like Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, and so on. And they were feeling very isolated. They had never had to look for a job before in their lives. And we created a course, a six-week program called Career Action Groups, really that was intended to do two things. One was to provide community for all these really amazing people so that they didn't feel so alone in what they were experiencing. And two, uh, to provide skill building. A lot of these people, since they never had to look for a job before, they didn't know 
the the nuts and bolts of a job search. Everything from resume, LinkedIn really wasn't around at that time, helping them all the way through the negotiation phase. So every aspect of the career transition process. So that was the genesis of our company and that program that we ran was very successful for a number of years. And we ran it in multiple cities across the country. And ultimately the economy fortunately came back and when uh, those people landed jobs and needed uh, leadership support, they thought of us and so our business evolved in doing more corporate and or organizationally sponsored leadership development programs, whether that's one-on-one -on -one executive coaching. A career transition is still a core piece of what we do, but that was actually the genesis of Next Step Partners. Well, it's exciting for me to realize that out of such a disaster you saw an opportunity to help people and it's very inspiring i think to take a look at given the situation how can we serve and out of that you created such a fabulous niche and when i looked at your website and saw all of the coaches that are part of your team i was i was blown away how did you attract such an impressive team of coaches from around the country well, thank you. We, uh, we think the world of our principals and we have developed relationships with them over the years. Many of them have found us, whether that's through just mutual connections or through our thought leadership. And uh, many of them we've kept in touch with over the years. And as our business has grown and we had the need for more people in certain geographies and with specific uh, skill sets, we've brought them in and are really proud of the team that we've built. Well, I can see why. I took the time to read several of their bios, and as I say, it was really impressive. I would encourage anyone in our audience today to take the time to go to Next Step Partners and look at the bench strengths she has on this team. It's really amazing. And, you know, as coaches, and I know that you know this, just want to tap into your insights for our audience. In order for an organization to transform, the people have to transform. And with that in mind, would you please talk to us about the difference between a tactical mindset and a strategic mindset that fuels that transformation? Yes, it's not so much tactical versus uh, strategic, although that is uh, an important distinction to make. It's more what we would refer to as the technical versus adaptive aspect of change. And to use a really simplistic example, let's just say we have a goal for ourselves of losing 10 pounds. The technical aspect of that change is I know I need to eat more fruits and vegetables, I need to cut carbs, eliminate sweets, etc., and go to the gym three or four times a week. Those are the technical aspects of that change and they're important, excuse me, they can get us some initial progress. However, if the challenge is really what we would refer to as adaptive in nature, meaning it's more tied to our mindset and how we think. For example, uh, if we associate food with love, or if I believe that I'm not being sociable, if I don't have dessert with my friends, all of those technical things will only get me so far until I start backsliding into old behaviors. For me to really transform and reach my goal and sustain that goal, sustain that achievement, uh, I need to change the way that I think. And that is the real differentiator in one's learning and development and creating sustainable change over time. So we can translate that into a professional setting. And using your example of helping someone become more strategic, the technical aspect of that change might be starting to delegate or carve out thinking time, etc. But if the underlying mindset or limiting beliefs are that if I delegate, I'm going to get cut out of the loop and become irrelevant, I can't really make that sustainable change or that transformation until I change the way that I think. Absolutely. And especially if we want that change to be long lasting. So why do you think the process of changing one's thinking then and the behaviors that follow that change thinking 
is easier and even faster with a professional coach? Well, a coach can help us see things that one may be right in front of us, but we don't see them, or we may need to peel back a few layers to be able to get to those things. And so a coach will know the right questions to ask to prompt deeper levels of thinking and reflection to help get at these things that might be keeping us stuck. Yes. I I really like that you said sometimes the evidence is right in front of us, but it can be so much easier for an outside person to come in and see it and even talk about it. With that, Rebecca, when do you think is a good time to hire a coach? Many of our audience, maybe they've worked with trainers. I know many of them have worked with me, but that one-on-one coaching is so powerful. Are there signs people should look for? Like, okay, this is the time for me to hire a coach. Right. There are a number of different situations where a coach can be helpful. One is you may have um, stepped into a new role of some kind, whether that's a promotion or a new job, and something new is going to be required of you, where your prior skill sets may have served you up until this point, but they are no longer going to serve you moving forward. In fact, they may um, actually derail you from being successful. So Mm -hmm. that is one potential situation. Another situation is wanting to go for that promotion or that next job to help step up to new challenges. Another time that people engage coaches is where they want to make a particular change, but they've been unsuccessful in doing so on their own, and they may feel a bit stuck. Excellent. And I I appreciate you giving some specific examples there because in one way, I think it's always a good time to hire a coach because even if we're doing okay, maybe we're a little bit more profitable this year than we were last year with our products or services. And so we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. But there is, I think, consistently going to be opportunities to stretch ourselves and grow. I'd like to get your input on this. Well, a coach could certainly help you uh, step up to new challenges that perhaps you did not think yourself that you were capable of achieving. Somebody who really sees you, who sees that potential um, that you can step into and accomplish. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. My next question for you has a little bit of a, a leading here for the benefit of our audience. The work of a coach is to help people step into those new challenges that we're talking about and then create alignment with the organization mission, values, and strategy. And then the exciting part for me as a coach is to accelerate those results based on the leading indicators that we assign with regard to their goals. And then hopefully we're going to gain some new insights and awareness of part of that process, which includes identifying our limiting beliefs. So here we go with the actual question. Oftentimes people ask me, well, how long does that process take? And I don't have a one size fits answer for that because it so much depends on the individual and the culture of their organization. But in really broad terms, my answer is usually this process is going to take anywhere from three months to a year or more, depending on the complexity of the situation, what people want to achieve, and the culture of their organization. How do you answer those types of questions? Because it seems to be one of those frequently asked questions. Yes. So there are, I would say, several variables involved. Our standard coaching engagements start at six months because change takes time. Having said that, there are things that one can do to accelerate the change. There's always the low-hanging fruit, but that does tend to be the technical stuff. And what we care about, uh, as we mentioned, is the sustainable change. I think that, as you alluded to a little earlier, the change does need to be aligned with the organization's interests and uh, really having everybody, both the individual being coached and their sponsor, who is typically their direct manager. And I can't underestimate the importance of having an engaged sponsor to help that individual be successful to help remove those obstacles or organizational constraints, because that's the other factor that we will see um, on occasion is organizational constraints that really limit just how successful the individual can be in accomplishing this goal. And to give you an example of that, I had a client who 
her goal was to get out of the weeds and be more strategic, which would require her to delegate to people. However, she did not have uh, the headcount to delegate to. So that was an organizational constraint that was going to keep her limited in how much progress she could make in getting out of the weeds if she had no one to delegate that aspect to. Right. And I appreciate you giving us a specific example of that. That to me, I'm going to categorize uh, as a little bit structural, not enough bodies to delegate to. Could you give us a different type of example of the kind of constraints that you've seen take place? Well, other constraints could be the support that this individual has in the organization for their success, whether that's from the sponsor or other key stakeholders. Yes, I encounter that as well. There's one thing to to say that we're supportive of the coaching process, but I find every now and again, people are like, well, that's great as long as I then don't have to change anything in my support of you. But I imagine you've seen some of that as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I've seen it, you know, um, uh, with a client. Another example comes to mind. This individual uh, is working on different aspects of improving the morale of the team that reports to him. And part of what he needs to do is really triage the work, prioritize the work. Um, he's in a very deal oriented environment. And part of that, he needs the support of the people above him to help him prioritize those projects or those deals. And, you know, if, if what this person's hearing is they're all important, that's not going to help very much. Right, exactly. People not receiving the necessary mentoring to learn how to appropriately prioritize because, as you say, not everything can be number one priority. So I think it would be useful for you to provide our listeners with an overview of the four habits of strategic thinking, if you could. And again, you're already really great at providing examples, so I appreciate it if you can do that here too. Sure. Uh, There are, I would say there's more than four, to start with the first one, it's an effective system of self-care because if we're not taking care of ourselves, we won't really have the space mentally or the capacity to think strategically if we're feeling frazzled. The second is paying attention to key stakeholders, one, knowing who they are, how important they are relative to each other, and what you need to be doing to be managing those key relationships. Another key elements, one of them must have in strategic thinking is having a, to me, a robust filter for demands on your time and energy. So whether that's an admin who can help you keep your calendar or somebody who can filter up to you just the most important requests and manage all of the other ones, uh, that will also help you be more strategic and having the right team to provide leverage. And this encompasses a couple of different teams. So one is in the hiring and selection of the right people. And sometimes we inherit teams uh, that are not necessarily the teams that we would have chosen on our own. Mm -hmm. So there it's making adjustments that need to be made. And if there are performance issues, managing them swiftly. I've had clients who part of their inability Um, when we started working together, part of their inability to get leverage was they were pulled down into the details and the weeds because they had not addressed performance issues to date. So that is really key in having the team that can provide you that leverage. And, you know, one other key one I would say, really having energizing opportunities for strategic thinking, knowing where and when you do your best thinking. I had a client, she actually did her best thinking out of the office, but she hadn't really given herself permission to be out of the office because there was a little bit of a FaceTime culture. You can learn more about strategic thinking habits by going to nextsteppartners.com and they've got an article there that you can check out. For example, one of my favorites is Seek Under the Radar Information where their article guides us to remember that strategic leaders are always looking to expand their understanding and know the unknowns. We're going to continue this interview with Rebecca right after this message. Live it. Mastering positive attitude habits will help you work smart and live happy. 
Livit is a text and workbook in one, with note-taking and action planners designed into the book. The content is based on activities training participants rated with five stars for more than 15 years. What makes this book different from other attitude books is you have everything you need to move from thinking to doing, from waiting to changing, and from surviving to thriving. Even people who are generally positive appreciate these action assignments that help you shake off attitude blockers, reconnect with your life vision, and demonstrate the consistent behaviors to move closer to goals in every area of your life. Get the book on Amazon today and get to work in the eight key areas of your life. If nothing changes, nothing changes. Go to Amazon now and purchase Catherine Goja's book, Live It, Mastering Positive Attitude Habits. Her 15 practical tips for managing your mindset have already inspired thousands of people, and they can help you work smart and live happy too. One of the reasons I was interested, Rebecca, in talking with you is there's something that we have in common, and that is a real focus on helping people get out of their own way. I close each episode with the encouragement for us to lead by example. So I wondered if you could give us a time when you recognized that you were in your own way and how you got that situation turned around. Wow, that's a really good question. I think I get in my own way all the time. (laughs) (laughs) I think when I'm feeling really stressed about something and it's weighing on me, causing anxiety, I try and take a step back and put it in perspective. That really helps me move forward in a more, not only more productive way, but in a more enjoyable way, frankly, because who wants to feel stressed and anxious? With practice, obviously as a coach, you learn how to coach yourself. How have you recognized, what are the signs that you recognize within yourself for when it's time to take a step back? I coach people to pay more attention to what's going on physically in their bodies. Um, How do you approach that sort of self-management and self-care? Yes, I think it is noticing what happens for you individually, like you said, in your body. And I'm not a a woo-woo type of coach, but this this type of stuff does show up physically. So it might be you're feeling really tense and tight, you know, in your muscles, Uh, Or it might be that you find that you have a lot less patience for the people around you and what's going on. Paying attention and really noticing in the moment what's happening. I find that I know I need to take a step back when I just don't have space. And I can't be thoughtful or strategic if I don't have space. So it's being really aware of that. And one of my favorite things to do is what's called defensive calendaring, yes, <laughs> which is looking out several weeks, even further on your calendar and just blocking out that space and protecting it. Because as we know, it can be really easy to just schedule right over it. So being really conscious of what boundaries are non-negotiable. I think that's excellent advice. Um, So listeners, let's have you take a look at, as you listen, what are the boundaries? Do you have boundaries already? And if so, how would you define them so that you can really take to heart this good advice that Rebecca is offering us today? And continuing down that same track, Rebecca, I'm a huge proponent of consistency and because I just don't think it's what we do every now and again that really makes the hugest difference. It's what we're thinking, what we're saying, what we're doing regularly that's going to kind of make or break our leadership success. So what advice can you share with us about the importance of consistency in a leadership role? Oh, wow. Well, it's hugely important. And finding the practices that are going to make you successful in whatever Um, goal or improvement area that you've set out for yourself and making sure those happen on a regular basis. There are a lot of things that I tell my clients that you're far better off doing one very small thing every day than a furious burst of effort over two weeks. Mm -hmm. A lot of these uh, types of changes are very cumulative and it's developing new habits. So starting small but being consistent Let's springboard on that, the starting small, 
piece. I wonder if you can think of one of your favorite success stories. I don't expect for you to mention people's names or company names, but one of your favorite success stories where a person through your work was able to make a small change that made a huge difference for them. Um, A client who comes to mind where starting small and being consistent in those small but important changes um, that comes to mind is somebody who was very impatient, short with their team, just domineering, frankly, would curse a lot, really sort of hijack (laughs) the agenda in meetings, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. A really small but significant change for this person was to not speak in meetings until a certain amount of time had passed. And for them, that was huge. And what that did was allow other people to contribute without fear of they are going to contradict him in some way, or he's already said that he doesn't like X, so I'm not going to put out my ideas about Y, Mm -hmm. but to provide that space for conversation, discussion, new ideas, because what he, the impact of his behaviors previously was he was really squashing any of that ideation or creativity or conversation or debate that would otherwise naturally happen in his meetings. I think that's a really great example. The question is, if I say or do this, will any good come of it? And Rebecca gives us a guideline here. You need to take a moment. You know, that whole, like, count to 10. And if you have to put it on a Post-it, if I say this or do this, will any good come of it? Any good come of it, will will it forward the meeting in any way? Will it help people brainstorm? Will it help them feel safe to share ideas? Excellent information there, Rebecca. Thank you for that. And, you know, I think it's hard sometimes in a coaching role because sometimes we can put that pressure on us. Well, if I'm going to go out and I'm going to train this, I'm going to coach it, then I dang well better be perfect in all this for myself. And of course, there's no such thing that exists. And yet, I think it's important to walk the talk. For you personally, how have teaching and leading these professional leadership qualities, how has that helped you in your personal life? Where How do those traits show up and help you there? Oh, wow. I learn a ton from my clients. Yes. I really, really do. And um, when I see what helps them be successful or conversely what gets in the way, it reminds me about what's important as I lead in my organization. So as an example, I'm working with somebody who historically has been much more task-focused than people-focused, and it has gotten in his way. Uh, to date, which is why I'm working with him. And it's a very good reminder. Okay, make sure you're paying attention to the people side of things, whether it's the recognition or inspiration or engagement aspect, really huge to pay and pay attention to. Yes, I think that's a really great example. And it's not easy to balance the task side of leadership and the people side of leadership. And I think a lot of us love to get work done, get things accomplished, but as everybody coming along with us, that's that's so important. And I'm going to swing back to something that you said earlier with regard to strategic thinking. You talked about the importance of self-care and taking really good care of ourselves on our own time so that we're ready to effectively lead. So along those lines, I'm wondering, how do you make time for fun and what are the kinds of things you like to do when you're not helping other people step into their high? potential? That's a great question. Well, I have to admit that one of my big areas of self-care is sleep. I try and make sure I get enough sleep. That's really important to my ability to be present and on when I am working with somebody. And then also, I when I go through stretches where I've been working really hard, I have a reward for myself. It's sort of like a light at the end of the tunnel. If I have a, a, I remember I had a really big project and I put a ton of work into it and I worked really hard and, you know, there was some stress around. I really want this to go well. And I booked a two hour massage for myself immediately following that workshop. Yes. Yeah. So part reward, part 
you know, incentive to just keep your eye on the prize and make this as good as it can be. And you're going to have a great two hour massage afterwards. It sounds exactly like the, the kind of reward I like to give myself as well. I'm a huge fan of massages and pedicures. So I'm right there with you. Yeah. But also reconnecting with friends. That's hugely important to our well being are the social ties that we have. Because when we get caught up in work and when we are um, pushing towards those big deadlines, we can sort of have blinders on and block a lot of that other stuff out. And so taking time to reconnect with the people around you, I think is also a really good practice. So to build on that for our audience, even if you just schedule in one time a month, connecting with the people who you care about that you might not get to see as regularly as you would like to see them, you know, that might give you the juice to be a better leader too. So I I appreciate that you brought that up. And I want to keep going, Rebecca, on this balance of the personal side of our life and the professional side of our life. I'm wondering if you would share a goal that you have in each of those areas for yourself this year. Wow, that's a great question. I think a career goal, they're sort of mesh together, if you will. I think um, I had a really great year last year, one of my best years, and I'm really pleased with the outcome. And I worked really hard. (laughs) Yes. So part of the goal is, can I sustain that level of performance and have more balance in doing it? So I would say it's a a double-sided goal. That sounds great. And what's your plan to accomplish that? I am actually trying to figure that out. It's funny that you asked that because on Thursday I'm flying out to Miami to join a, it's called a mastermind group sure, of sure. like-minded folks who really are looking at the same question, sort of how to sustain and improve their, their business performance. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, I applaud you for that because I think to get out of your normal environment and connect with new people in new ways and other thought leaders such as yourself, it's pretty exciting. I love it. I do too. And the other thing you just know is going to happen, you're going to end up having conversations that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Absolutely. Well, I want to encourage everyone listening today to definitely go to your website, nextuppartners.com, and look at all of the resources they have available on the website there. By the way, I thought your website design was nicely done. It's clean, beautiful icons. And just to give you one example of the kind of resources Rebecca has available, there's a free ebook you can download. It is 10 tips on how to get the most out of coaching. And then also, she has a guide available for you on Amazon. It is the career handbook for working professionals. Um, What would you also categorize as some of your other big hitter resources that you might have available for people, Rebecca? Sure. Well, one of the coaching tips that you mentioned, you can just go to nextsteppartners.com slash 10, the number 10 tips. And another great resource is um, a list of our favorite leadership development resources. And for that, you can go to nextsteppartners.com slash list. I hope you all will do that after you listen to the episode today. I encourage you to go download those resources right away within the next couple of minutes, because if you wait any time at all, chances are you won't get it done. And I want to make sure that you tap into that excellent knowledge she's making available. Rebecca, is there anything else you would like to share with the Relatable Leader audience today? I think that's it. People can follow me on Twitter at rszucker and look forward to having a, a future conversation with you. That sounds great. And I think you're also on LinkedIn. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah. So that's another way that people can have that connection with you um, and stay active with what's going on. Yes. Well, we wish you the best in all of your work. And again, high five to you for the way that you got your organization started in the first place. And I just know you're going to go out there this year and help a lot of people. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me here at the Relatable Leader Podcast. 
It is my mission to support your success through tools and knowledge you can apply immediately. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode. Until then, take good care of yourselves and lead by example. Thank you.